Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh. The President of the United States of America, Joe Biden, recently termed Pakistan as one of the most dangerous places in the world that has got nuclear weapons without any cohesion. Some political commentators try to downplay this assessment as an off-the-cuff remark by the American president. But Joe Biden was essentially echoing a deep-seated concern that the American state has always had about Pakistan's nuclear weapons. And as expected, this assessment sparked an immediate diplomatic rave. Islamabad summoned the American ambassador Donald Bloom for an explanation. And surprise, surprise, a day later, the U.S. State Department expressed its confidence in the safety of the Pakistani nuclear arsenal. The United States uh, is confident of Pakistan's commitment and its ability to secure uh, its nuclear assets. So why did the United States walk back on the remark that was made by their president? Especially as this is a concern that has been raised many times within the American security establishment. Ever since, Pakistan had simultaneously carried out five nuclear tests on the 28th of May in 1998 at the Rasko Hills in the Chagai district of the Balochistan province in an operation that was codenamed Chagai-1. Two days later, Pakistan carried out a second nuclear test that was codenamed Chagai-2. But consider this, there are at least about 12 US designated global terror networks that operate from the Pakistani soil. And the fear that the Pakistani nuclear weapons could one day end up in the hands of terrorists or other non-state actors has been a recurrent theme in the assessments made by the American security think tanks. In 2004, A.Q. Khan, the man who is known as the father of the Pakistani nuclear bomb, confessed to leaking nuclear secrets to Iran, North Korea and Libya. But he was later given a presidential pardon. So with this track record, how does the United States sit quiet that the Pakistani nuclear weapons are in safe hands? Actually, it doesn't. And this is where things get very interesting. The United States spent an estimated $100 million between 2001 and 2007 on improving the security of Pakistan's nuclear program. If ever an American president were to feel that Pakistan's nuclear weapons are a threat to the United States or to its interests, which could happen in any number of different scenarios, such as Pakistan plunging into internal chaos or terrorists mounting a serious attack on Pakistan's nuclear facilities or hostilities breaking out with India, or Islamist radicals taking charge of the Islamabad government or the Pakistani army, then in a contingency plan that has been described as snatch and grab has been devised by the Pentagon. Now this is a scenario where the US Special Forces will intervene either in cooperation with the Pakistani military or unilaterally to spirit away Pakistan's nuclear weapons. But there is no guarantee that Pakistan's military will cooperate with the Americans. So what do the Pakistanis officially say about this American snatch and grab plan? The former Pakistani president, General Parvez Musharraf, was categorical. Any such attempt at snatch and grab of Pakistani nuclear arsenal would result in an immediate all-out war. Terming the nuclear arsenal as the pride of Pakistan, Musharraf has described the snatch and grab plan as foolhardy, as the Pakistani nuclear weapons are hidden deep inside tunnels under mountains and dispersed in various army bases with its air force and also with Pakistan's navy. Pakistan's nuclear arsenal is said to be guarded by a corps of 18,000 elite special forces. Even at the height of America's notorious war on terror in Afghanistan, when Washington had armed and given military aid and had relied on Pakistan as a strategic partner, the United States still remained extremely suspicious of Pakistani nukes. So where does Pakistan keep its nuclear weapons? Now this map shows you the four air bases where Pakistan stations its nuclear capable fighter jets. While this map will give you an idea of the missile garrisons from where Pakistan can launch its nuclear missiles. Islamabad also has submarines through which it can launch nuclear cruise missiles. Now, as of 2021, Pakistan is estimated to have a total of 165 nuclear warheads. Like the United States, Russia, the United Kingdom and France 
Pakistan does not adhere to the no first use policy as a part of its nuclear doctrine. While India and China are the only two nuclear powers to formally abide by the no first use nuclear doctrine. Dr. Parvez Hoodboy, a leading expert on Pakistan's nuclear program, insists that the days of smuggling centrifuges out of Kahuta, one of Pakistan's main nuclear research facilities, ended with AQ Khan. And what is more, Kahuta is not even the leading facility for providing fissile material that is needed to assemble a nuclear weapon. And this map will show you the different enrichment plants that Pakistan has constructed in the last three decades. The nuts and bolts of the strategy of how the United States will carry out its snatch and grab plan remains highly classified. It is also difficult to predict what will happen in the event the United States ever decides to attempt this audacious plan. But what is clear is that the reason why the spokesperson of the State Department stepped up to reassure everyone about the safety of Pakistan's nuclear weapons is because, in a way, the Pentagon has a top secret and also a well laid out plan to spirit away Pakistan's nuclear weapons at a moment of its choosing. Vladimir Putin has a dire warning. He's predicted that this decade is going to be the most dangerous and the most unpredictable one since the end of the Second World War. And on the battlefields of Ukraine, Moscow has accused Kiev of planning to deploy a dirty bomb. But what really is a dirty bomb? And why does the rhetoric of the use of such a contraption threaten an uncontrolled escalation before the winter sets in? Our next report gets you more. The battle for Kazan is underway. Heavy Western weapons, which allowed Ukraine to dominate the battlefield in the initial days of the counteroffensive, are no longer yielding the same kind of results. In the last fortnight, Moscow has reworked its ground strategy. It has tightened its logistical supply lines and has largely managed to blunt the Ukrainian onslaught. You must hear it from a Ukrainian commander as to how things are playing out in the battlefield. The situation on the front line itself is very tense. The enemy has dug itself on their positions, and at the moment it seems they do not intend to leave. It is noticeable that they work to reinforce their dugouts, trenches and fortifications. They use heavy artillery, heavy weapons and mortars. But never mind, we are also giving them hard time. Our response is not any worse. But the enemy is not stupid. They understand what the war is like. And it is not the first year they are at war. Kherson was the first major city captured by the Russians in the first few weeks of this war. Its strategic location makes it a gateway to Crimea. So the stakes are really high. But what has made matters worse is how far either side is willing to go in this bruising battle for Kherson. Russia has accused Ukraine of planning to detonate a dirty bomb. More than its impact, a dirty bomb's objective is to sow fear, panic and confusion by hurling radioactive shrapnel across a large radius around its area of explosion. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu has warned that the use of a dirty bomb will mean an uncontrolled escalation. But Kiev and its Western allies have dismissed the allegation. Escalating tensions further, Moscow this week conducted its nuclear exercises called the Grom, which means thunder in Russian. Moscow mobilized its nuclear submarines and its strategic bombers. Designed to deliver a massive nuclear strike, the Russian elite forces rehearsed firing intercontinental ballistic missiles from land and sea. While the Tu-95 strategic bombers fired cruise missiles from the air. 
Comrade Supreme Commander in Chief, the following is involved in the training. The Yars Mobile Ground Missile System of the Strategic Missile Forces, Strategic Missile Submarine of the Northern Fleet Tula, two strategic long range missile carriers Tu 95MS. The Russian nuclear war games took place just a week after NATO flew its strategic nuclear bombers in the European skies as part of its steadfast noon war games. On the conventional front, the biggest problem for Kiev are the Shahed-136 drones that have knocked out almost 40% of Ukraine's power infrastructure. Standing beside a downed Shahed drone, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky reaffirmed his country's resolve to fight back. More than 30 drones were released by Russia in two days. The defenders of our sky prevented the enemy's vultures from breaking through to the interior of the country and downed 23 Shahids. In addition, the KH-59 guided air missile, two KA-52 attack helicopters and another Su-25 attack aircraft were turned into scrap metal. According to Zelensky, Russia has carried out more than 8,000 air raids across Ukrainian skies in the last fortnight. It is difficult to predict the scale and trajectory of the war over the next few weeks. But what is becoming increasingly clear is that the battle lines have already frozen again, well before the onset of winter. When the snow begins to fall on the battlefield, it is going to get very cold and very hard for the people caught up in the war. For more than a month, Iran has been rocked by relentless protests ever since Mesa Amini died after being detained by Iran's notorious morality police. But this week, the Shah Chirag shrine in the southern Iranian city of Shiraz was struck by a terror attack. Fifteen people were killed and over 40 others were injured when three armed ISIS gunmen stormed inside the shrine and began to shoot whoever came in their way. But how widespread is the ISIS in Iran and what was the motive to target the Shah Chirag shrine? Our next report gets you more details. This is the chilling moment when the ISIS gunman walked into the Shah Shirag shrine with an assault rifle in hand. The gunman can be seen firing at whoever stepped into his way. According to reports, there were three attackers who stormed inside the shrine. This grainy footage was captured by a CCTV camera that was installed inside. The attack was perpetrated just before sundown, when the people were getting ready for their evening prayers. The Shah Shirag shrine is one of the holiest sites in Shia Islam. A total of 15 people were killed, including two young children and a woman, and over 40 others are reported to be injured. There is a small closet on the left side of the entrance. I went there and hid. Some other worshippers came in along with me. Then the terrorist showed up and started firing his machine gun inside the room. Some people were injured and a number of people were killed. I got hit in the neck. The ISIS has claimed responsibility for the attack. Two gunmen have been arrested, while the hunt is on for the third one. The authorities investigating the case have said that the attackers are not Iranian nationals. Security has now been beefed up at the entrance. Anyone entering into the expansive premises of the shrine is being frisked before being let in. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi has said that the attack in Shiraz will not go unanswered, but the common Iranian people are not convinced that their government is doing enough to protect them. There was an immediate outpouring of grief. 
thousands took to the streets demanding justice for the victims. With what I'm seeing, it's been 43 years that the West and the enemies of the Islamic Republic have been plotting against us. They're using every means possible and now their plan is to focus on our younger generations and cause them to fight with each other. All this is being done to create division and they will not get any results with this attempt of theirs. Critics of the Iranian government have alleged that Tehran is using the terror attack in Shiraz to deflect attention away from the widespread protests that are happening against compulsory hijab after the death of Masa Amini. But the Ibrahim Raisi government has rubbished the allegations. Attacking holy shrines and attacking mosques, especially of the Shia sect, has been an ISIS trademark. In 2017, the ISIS had staged a twin attack on the Iranian parliament and also on the tomb of the Islamic Republic's founder, Ayatollah Khomeini. And this latest terror attack in Shiraz is the clearest indicator that the ISIS is trying to spread its tentacles wider across Iran. Six Palestinians were killed in sweeping Israeli raids in the occupied West Bank on the 25th of October. This was the deadliest assault so far in this year of sparling violence. For its part, Tel Aviv claims that the overnight operation targeted a group called the Lion's Den that has merged recently with its stated objective to stop Israeli incursions into Palestinian lands. And what is interesting is that Lion's Den has acquired an immediate fan following across the West Bank. But why has Israel resorted to these repeated raids into Palestinian territories since the beginning of this year? Our next report gets you more details. In its deadliest incursion this year, the Israeli army killed six Palestinians in Nablus, in the northern part of the West Bank. In this video, released by the Israeli army, the Israeli police and intelligence officers are seen carrying out the intelligence-based operation. The Israeli army claims to have targeted a site that was reportedly used by the chief operatives of the Lion's Den. Israeli forces bombed what they described as the headquarters and a workshop for making weapons. The Israeli Prime Minister lavished praise on the operation for singling out the leader of the Lion's Den. The targeting of the head of the Lion's Den organization, Wadiya Alhu, along with additional terrorists last night in Nablus, is the result of joint efforts by the security forces, the IDF, ISA, and the Israel National Counterterrorism Unit. As part of the operation, the terrorist laboratory of the Lion's Den was severely damaged. This was a lethal precision strike at the heart of a terrorist cell that was trying to carry out attacks. A sea of mourners poured onto the streets of Nablus, carrying the bodies of Palestinians killed in the Israeli raids. Masked gunmen, wielding heavy artillery, were part of the procession as they fired gunshots into the air. The nascent militant group called Arin al Osad, or the Lion's Den in English, is essentially a coalition of young Palestinian men, some of whom are also associated with Fatah, Hamas and Islamic Jihad. The newly formed group is immensely popular across West Bank and in recent months has launched multiple attacks from Nablus. Two weeks ago, it claimed responsibility for the deadly attack on an Israeli soldier. Nablus, the second biggest city in the occupied Palestinian territories, along with nearby Janine, have been the most affected by the Israeli incursions. All these crimes through which the criminal occupation tries to bring the resistance to its knees only make it stronger and more determined. 
This Palestinian generation was raised with pride and will not be intimidated by the Israeli war machine. All these crimes will not go unpunished and the Israeli occupation will pay the price for these crimes. More than a hundred Palestinians have been killed since the beginning of this year, which is the highest number of fatalities in the West Bank in the last seven years. while about 20 Israelis have been killed in attacks staged by Palestinian militants. Both Israeli forces and the Palestinian militants have been accused of perpetrating war crimes. With no prospects of peace talks anywhere on the horizon, it is hard to see how this cycle of violence will end. The Sahel nation of Chad is on the boil. At least about 50 people have been killed and over 300 others injured in deadly clashes between the protesters and the police. The trouble began when anti-government protesters staged demonstrations against the military's grip and power. But instead of responding to the demands of the protesters, the government announced a curfew and suspended all public activities. And what followed on the streets of the capital of Chad has been described as a carnage by eyewitnesses. The trouble began on the 20th of October. Hundreds of demonstrators began to gather in Chad's capital with the demand that elections must be held. As had been agreed by Mohammed Idris Debi. But the police resorted to firing tear gas shells. And when this did not disperse the protesters, the security personnel were ordered to open fire. The unrest soon spread beyond the Chadian capital to other major towns and cities. Cars and barricades were torched. And in just a matter of a few hours, over 50 people had been killed and over 300 others injured. The government soon announced a curfew, suspended all public activities, and blamed the demonstrators for the violence and deaths. These insurgents bear the heavy responsibility of around 50 dead and nearly 300 wounded, especially in N'Djamena, but also in Mondu, Doba and Komra. The transitional government that I head, following the extremely serious abuses experienced this morning, has taken the following precautionary measures. The establishment of a curfew from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. until the total restoration of order in N'Djamena, Mondu, Doba and Komra. The protesters insist they were only responding to a call by the opposition campaigners to mark the date when Chad's military junta had promised to hand over power. Instead, at a national forum organized by the military leader, it was decided that Debbie will remain at the helm of affairs for two more years before elections will be held. The 38-year-old five-star general Mohammed Idris Debbie had seized power in April 2021 after the death of his father, Idris Debi, who had ruled Chad for 30 years. The parliament was dissolved and the constitution suspended. Heading a junta of 15 generals, General Mohammed Idris Debi had promised to hand over power after 18 months, a period that would have ended this month. The African Union has condemned the security crackdown on the dissenters and has called for peace. A summit was held in Kinshasa to discuss the unrest in Chad. Representatives of 11 countries of the community of Central African states assembled to deliberate on the process of political transition. But pro-democracy protesters insist the junta leader General Mohammed Idris Debi will use the next two years to consolidate his hold on power with no guarantee of a peaceful transition to democratic rule. Thanks for watching World at War. And if you want to reach out to me with any suggestions or comments or feedback, please feel free to tweet to me on the Twitter handle that you see on your screens. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week.